Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about inverse trig functions, but before we get started with that, I want to do a little bit of review on just inverse functions in general. We're not going to cover every single fact or detail about inverse functions, just the really important ones, the stuff we're going to need to work with our inverse trig functions. So to start our general little review of inverse functions, I want to first start with a function map. And so both of these circles we're interpreting as sets, maybe the one on the left is our set of inputs. Remember, we call that the domain. And the set on the right over here will be our outputs, or what we call the range. So if we have some input value or element, like maybe an x value, then that's going to get mapped to some y value or some function value. Maybe we'll call that f of x. So remember, all a function is is just a rule, a matching rule, that matches up these inputs to these outputs or these elements in the domain to these corresponding elements in the range. And when we're drawing our little function maps here, we we'll usually use an arrow to indicate the function itself. So our function is just mapping our inputs to our outputs. Our inverse function is simply just reversing this process, undoing what the original function did. So the inverse function will go backwards. It'll take that output and map it back to its input. And remember, our function notation for denoting these inverse functions looks like f raised to the power of negative 1. But that is not how we find the inverse. We'll talk about that later. So this is our function notation for an inverse function. It is not the same as our function raised to the power of negative 1. So we're still in our general review for inverse functions, but to put a little bit of context to how this is going to uh, apply for us for our inverse trig functions, so the domain of our trig functions are our inputs. Those are like our angles or arc lengths, and the outputs of our trig functions are those ratios of triangles or points on the unit circle, depending on our interpretation. So a normal trig function will input an angle or an arc length and spit out a number corresponding to some ratio. So our inverse trig function is actually going to have its input as that ratio from a triangle or points on our unit circle. And what our inverse trig function will actually output is the angle or arc length that is associated with that ratio that we plugged in. All right, so we're going to need a few more facts about inverse functions before we start applying those to our inverse trig functions. And one of the important ones that we're going to have to cover carefully is not every single function is actually invertible. So let me clarify what I mean by that. When I say that not every function is invertible, what I mean is if we look at the inverse of every function, the inverse is not always itself its own function. There is a condition or property out there, though, that guarantees our function will have an inverse that is also a function, and that's when we call a function one-to-one. -one. So if our function is one-to-one, -one, then it is always going to have an inverse function, or it's always going to have an inverse that itself is also a function. And remember, we say a function is one-to-one -one if each output corresponds to one and only one input. Our trig functions are not actually one-to-one, -one, so we're going to have to come up with a way to overcome this issue. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. So before we get to some of that, how do we know if a function is one-to-one? -one? Well, we have to check if every output corresponds to only one input. And the easy way to do that is graphically using that horizontal line test. Remember, the way the horizontal line test works is a horizontal line is representing one singular y value or one output. And if that horizontal line crosses the graph of our function more than once, then that means the graph of our function will have that output or that y value occur multiple times or for more than one input or x value. So if any horizontal line ever crosses our function more than once, then our function is not one-to-one. -one. Only our one-to-one -one functions are going to have inverses that are also functions. The next note that I want to make can actually be observed from our little function map over here. And this is one that's kind of already been mentioned, but we really want to write down and emphasize, and that's that when we're looking at a function compared to its inverse, the, uh, the domain and range for the function and its inverse are just uh, switching up. So what I mean by that is if we have a specified domain set and a range set for a given function f, and then we want to find the domain and range of the inverse function, f inverse, well, the inputs of the inverse are the outputs of the function, so the range of the function becomes the domain of the inverse, and similarly, the domain of the original function becomes the set of outputs, and therefore the range of the inverse function. And so there's a very nice uh, consequence of that statement that allows us to find points on the graph of our inverse functions and eventually graph the entire inverse function itself. 
So if we have a point AB on the graph of our original function f, so A is like our x value and B is our y value, then we're going to be guaranteed to have the point B comma A on the graph of our inverse function. And this comes directly from the statement we just made. So if A is our input and B is our output, and this is in terms of the original function, then for the inverse function, everything switches, the output becomes the input, and the input becomes the output. So that guarantees we're going to have that point B comma A on the graph of the inverse function. And so we can do that for every single point on the graph of our function, find all those x and y coordinates, switch them, plot those, and we'll get the graph of our inverse function. And what ends up happening graphically when we do that for every single point on the graph of the function is we end up reflecting the graph of the function over the line y equals x. And so that's the last little note I wanted to make here for these general inverse functions. The graph of a function f and its inverse are always going to be reflections of each other over that diagonal line through the origin y equals x. All right, everyone, so now that we've covered our quick little review of inverse functions in general, we're ready to start talking about our inverse trig functions, and we're going to go ahead and start with our inverse sine function. So on the board, I have the graph of our normal sine function. It looks like we're looking at two periods of our normal sine function on the interval from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. And remember, in our review of the general inverse functions, we said a function had an inverse that was only a function if the function itself was one-to-one. -one. And so the issue that we see with our sine functions graph is going to be the same issue that we encounter with the graph of all of our trig functions, and that's that they are clearly not going to be one-to-one -one functions. Our sine function, and this is going to be true for our other trig functions, spectacularly fail that horizontal line test. And so that means as they are currently kind of defined and expressed, our trig functions are not going to be invertible. Even though our trig functions, as they are formally defined, do not uh, give us one-to-one -one functions or functions that are invertible, we still are really going to need these inverse trig functions, especially when we want to try to solve our trigonometric equations. So the way we get around this issue is we're actually going to restrict the domain of our original sine function to a smaller interval so that it becomes one-to-one -one on that interval. So remember, the domain of our sine function, uh, formally, is all real numbers. It goes from negative infinity or as far to the left as we want, all the way to positive infinity or as far to the right as we want. And so the way we can make our sine function invertible now is restricting the domain to a smaller interval onto an interval where it is one-to-one. -one. And technically, there are infinitely many choices and ways in which we could do this, but there's a standard convention that is used by everyone around the world, and that's what we're going to use as well. And I think it's also one of the more intuitive choices to make. We want to make that domain smaller than the original domain, and we also want that new domain to get through the entire range of our function in the nicest way as possible. What I mean by that is we don't want a lot of discontinuities or jumps around. And so I think the most natural choice that we might see to do this is to cut off the rest of our sine function that's outside of this interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we really just want this chunk or piece of our sine function on this interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. I'm highlighting that in green now. All right, so I've gone ahead and done the next couple steps of our process for us. So let me go ahead and explain exactly what I have on the board now. So remember, we were looking at the original sine function, but it was not a one-to-one -one function. So we restricted the graph of our function to the smaller domain or this interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's what we're looking at on this next graph over here, that restricted piece of our sine function on the interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now our sine function is one-to-one -one on this interval and passes that horizontal line test. So we can look at its inverse. That's what we have graphed over here. And its inverse now is also its own function. And so one of the reasons why we need the inverse to be a function, and we'll talk more about this later, is when we're solving our trig equations, like maybe we want to find out when sine of x is equal to zero, our process is going to involve taking sine inverse of that output or y value, so taking sine inverse of zero. And well, when we plug something like zero into sine inverse, or when if we plug anything into an inverse function or any function, we always just want to get one output or one answer. The problem here is if we tried to find out when is sine of x equal to zero, well, we have infinitely many solutions to that, but we still want our inverse to only give us one of those infinitely many solutions. That's what this whole process is kind of working towards. Eventually, we'll figure out how to recover the rest of those hidden solutions, but that's a topic for another video.
So I've explained how I obtained the small segment of our sine graph to make it one to one. And I said that I graphed the inverse over on this other set of axes over here, but I didn't go through the details of graphing the inverse. But to graph the inverse by hand, we'd essentially just use that process that I described earlier for a general inverse function. We reflect this graph over the line y equals x, and that obtains this green graph over here that is representing the inverse of our sine function, or a little bit more systematically or carefully, we can take a bunch of different points on the graph of sine of x on this restricted interval, switch the x and y coordinates of those points, and obtain the corresponding points on the graph of the inverse. That's the same as reflecting the graph over the line y equals x, but it's a more um, maybe careful approach. The main point of looking at the graph of the inverse sine function is really to uh, help set up and make sense of this restricted domain that is necessary for the work we're going to be doing um, coming up. So this really is the first time we're seeing this inverse sine function. So let's go ahead and write down some of that important information that we like to write down for our functions, like what is the domain, what is the range, and is there any symmetry? So these facts I'm about to write down are for our sine inverse function. And just as another note, sometimes our sine inverse function, and this is true for all of our inverse trig functions, will also be denoted using like arc sine or arc of our other trig functions. It doesn't matter which notation you use, you can use whichever you prefer. Uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to both of these notations, right? For the sine inverse of x notation right here, it's like our normal inverse uh, function notation, so that might be more familiar to us and easy to recognize. But the disadvantage is sometimes that's easy to mix up with sine to the power of negative one, that is not the same as one over sine of x or cosecant of x. And we can see that from the graph here. So one of the things I like about calling it the arc sine function is that name arc sine really tells us what is coming out of our function. Remember, one of the ways we defined our sine function is as that relationship between the uh, angle or arc length on the unit circle and the y coordinate at that terminal point on our unit circle. So our normal sine function inputs an angle or an arc length and spits out a y coordinate or a ratio. And now our arc sine function does the opposite of that. So its output is going to be that angle or that arc length. So calling it arc sine reminds us what is coming out of our inverse function is an arc length or an angle on the unit circle. So next thing we wanna write down for our inverse sine or arc sine function is the domain of our arc sine function. Remember these are the set of inputs or x values that we are allowed to throw into our inverse sine function. We can see from the graph of our arc sine function that the domain is gonna be the set of x values such that x is between negative one and positive one. And we could have also observed that by looking at the range of our restricted sine function. Remember the range becomes the domain when we look at that relationship between a function and its inverse. And similarly, the, uh, the domain of our original function becomes the range of our inverse function. So from that, we can tell that the range or set of outputs for our arc sine or inverse sine function are gonna be these angles or arc lengths from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. And the last little thing we can observe about our inverse sine function is that it does actually exhibit some of that symmetry we always look for. Remember, we usually look for that even or odd symmetry. And we're looking at the graph of our arc sine function, we can see that it does have that odd symmetry. A horizontal reflection is equivalent to a vertical reflection, or if we were to rotate the graph around the origin 180 degrees, it wouldn't really change anything. It would look exactly the same. That's what it means to have odd symmetry. Not going to be a super important property for us, but always nice to point out if we can't observe it. So one last thing I want to mention before we start doing some exercises and examples using our inverse sine function is, well, the graph of the inverse sine function is nice. It helps us explain why this restricted domain is necessary and all of that but it's not really helpful when it comes to evaluating our inverse sine function. So when it actually comes to evaluating our inverse sine function by hand, I'm not gonna think about this weird graph in the xy plane. I'm actually gonna go back to the unit circle, and that I think is the proper way to do it. <clears throat> so remember, on the unit circle, we're gonna have all these known points that we figured out earlier and all these angles or arc lengths associated with them. So when we're trying to evaluate a sine inverse expression, like what is sine inverse of one half, we're gonna to try to figure out what angle on our unit circle corresponds to that uh, y-coordinate of one half. 
but we're going to have to be careful here because there's going to be multiple angles or arc lengths on our unit circle that get us to a point with a y coordinate of one half. There's infinitely many of those angles or arc lengths out there, but we're only going to get one from using our inverse sine function, that one on this uh, range of values from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So if we think about this range of y values for our inverse sine function, remember these outputs are y values are actually the outputs of our inverse sine function, and those are going to be angles or arc lengths. So what are the angles or arc lengths on our unit circle from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2? Well, remember, negative pi over 2 starts down at the bottom of our unit circle, and that interval is going to go up to 0, and then continue to positive pi over 2. So the point I'm trying to make here is when we're thinking about evaluating our inverse sine function, we're really going to be thinking about that right half of our unit circle, and furthermore, that part of our right half in the unit circle that is in the fourth quadrant, we're going to have to relabel with these negative angles instead of those positive angles from, say, pi, 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. And so that's going to be one of the things we're going to have to be very careful and emphasize when we talk about the difference between evaluating an inverse trig expression and solving a trig equation.